Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's training session on Soulful Voices, Three-Part Harmony of Listening. I know I have one live participant with me at the moment. We, if we have others join on while, uh, while, they're, while we're doing this today, please feel free to hop into the chat room and say hello and let us know where you're joining us from. And uh, later on after the recording and after the webinar, I'll try to share some details on how to get the, the slides and uh, we'll record this so that folks can watch it and share it again. So thank you again so much for joining me. I love hearing from everyone. We've had uh, fellow hospice workers all across the country uh, watch these recordings. I've had friends and uh, colleagues in, in crime doing doing their work, not in the crime business, but in the uh, some of them working in uh, rescue missions, some of them are teachers, some of them are hospice workers, some of them are nurses in the healthcare field. So wherever you are serving, whatever you're doing to advance faith, hope, and love, I just want to share a huge thank you for what you're uh, doing out there. You're giving of yourself, you're giving of your time, your attention, uh, you're giving of your heart and your soul to people to advance hope. And uh, that just really makes me encouraged, makes me smile. I'm thrilled to join you for this time. So today's webinar is going to be on listening. And I don't know about you, but I uh, just always have loved music. I just, I want music wherever I go. It bugs me when I go into a store and they don't have some sort of music playing. Or if I'm uh, just doing file work in the office, I want to make sure I've got either my sports radio on or uh, Google on to listen to some music or YouTube videos on in the background. And I was thinking too, uh, one of my favorite styles of music is anything where it's got harmony. And I was fortunate enough when I was in college to be a part of our concert and our jazz band. We would go on a spring tour. Uh, sometimes it was just around Colorado. One year we got to go all the way out to Chicago. And so we, that year that we went out to Chicago, we brought our vocal jazz group with us, and they were terrific. They were like uh, the popular group Pentatonics, or maybe you're familiar with like barbershop quartet groups out there that sing everything in, in harmonious uh, parts, and it was just terrific. We brought this group out there, and we went to this Chicago restaurant that maybe if you're from the area, if you heard of it, it was called Ed DeBevick's. And it's kind of the 1950s diner where it's like in vogue to be rude to your customers and tell everyone to sit down and shut up and what are you going to order? And and they saw us all come in, about 30 of us with our t-shirts on, our band t-shirts on. And they were giving us trouble for what we were doing in there. And one of our group said, well, we're a, we're a singing group. And they said, oh, yeah, well, come up front and sing for your dinner. And so they did. About three or four of our, our vocalists went up to the front of the restaurant. It was packed. It was probably like a Friday night. And they got on the one microphone that was in the, that ran the PA system in the restaurant. And the four or five of them gathered around together and they sang the song together in just beautiful harmony. And it was so cool to listen to. And, and I remember that so clearly. And I, I just love it. It sends shivers up my spine when I hear the voices coming together that way. Well, it's maybe a lot easier to listen to a three-part harmony uh, coming from really, really good singers uh, than it is necessarily to sit and really be present and tune in and listen to someone who's sharing a story of heartache or despair or trouble. But I find that the more attention, the more tuning in and listening to someone's story that we can provide, tuning in with the same level of intention, same level of presence, same level of, of focus as we would with, as we did sing, listening to our, our friends sing in the restaurant, as maybe you listen to your favorite uh, radio station. If we can bring that same amount of attention and focus to our listening when someone's in trouble, when someone's hurting, suffering, might be a five-year-old child on the playground that comes to their school teacher, it might be the 85-year-old um, who's suffering from an a irreversible illness. It might be your neighbor who's going through a divorce, or um, it might be at the local soup kitchen that you volunteer at, that you're listening to stories of, of trials and troubles. And I just am a firm believer that if we could bring 
the same intention of listening to those stories that we did to listening to our favorite music or listening to a Beethoven symphony that we would do a, a wonderful job of advancing faith, hope, and love to those folks in those difficult trials. So today you're gonna, we're going to join together in, in three-part harmony of listening. And the goals of our, our session today are very simple. The first one is to identify the three parts of every person's story. And we'll get into that. Again, whether they're five or 105, every story of, of joy, every so story of sorrow has different parts to it. We want to be uh, good listeners to those parts of the story. We want to differentiate between the levels of listening, and you'll see how the levels of listening tie into the parts of the story. We want to understand what are some key questions that we can ask to gain clarity. We want to also encourage you to develop your spirit of curiosity. Curiosity may be killed the cat, but it sure doesn't hurt when it comes to listening. And finally, our fifth goal for today, and, and for those of you that will watch this webinar down the road, is I want to see you all and encourage you all and help you to practice active listening and practice the validation process. So if you have a pen and paper handy or maybe you've got a, a on your computer, you can open up another screen and something that you can take some notes with. Maybe there will be um, something with this that you'll be able to, to jot down some uh, keys to help you with these uh, parts of listening. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Are you listening? Are you there? Can you hear me? Maybe that was a cell phone commercial. Maybe you remember like the picture in the, on the screen uh, playing the game telephone, stringing together a couple of tin cans with a string and, and speaking into the can and seeing if the other person really could hear you. Maybe they could hear you, but were they listening? Even with all of our 4G cell phone technology, on my drive home from work, if I'm talking to my wife, I know that there's a certain spot. Every time I get to that spot, I'm going to drop the call. And she'll start saying, well, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you there? So that's our focus today is really to answer the question, can you hear me now? Are you listening? Not only are you hearing me, but are you truly listening to the story? Stephen Covey has this wonderful quote from his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. How true is that? How many people do you know that when you're in a time of need or struggle and you go to them and you're trying to share your life, share your story with them, how many of them seem to already have their answer for you before you've even finished your first statement, your first sentence? How many times are we guilty of formulating our response for someone in need before we've truly listened, truly sought to understand where they're coming from? So there are certain keys that I believe are absolutely foundational to listening. First of all, I think that we need to really hone in on this truth that every person equals a story. You have a story. I have a story. Your neighbor has a story. Your fourth grader in your classroom has a story. The high school teenage girl who's sobbing her eyes out and comes to you as her big sister has a story. Every person has a story, and every story has three parts. The three parts of the story, I, I was taught this, and I really find it to be so true, are the parts of content, process, and metaphor. So three parts of every story, every person has a story. So you could say that every person has three parts of their life that we want to listen to. We listen to the content of their life, the processing of their life, and the metaphors that give meaning to their life. So we're going to talk today about soulful voices. And I believe that every person, again, whether it's a, a two-year-old crying in their preschool room or a 16-year-old who just got ex accepted into the National Honor Society or the 100-year-old who's celebrating her birthday with all of her family and friends, we want to tune into those moments. We want to listen to the soulful voice. Every person has a soulful voice that they're trying to communicate with. They're trying to communicate the deepest meaning, the deepest joys, the deepest sorrows of their life. And we want to tune into that. So hopefully today you'll gain some 
skills and gain some uh, resources to help you in that process. So listening to the story, listening as we know is not just hearing and being able to parrot back what someone is telling us. Listening goes so much deeper than that. Listening involves hands, head, and heart. And we're going to unpack this as we go. The hands are really where you focus on the content of the story. This is in journalism where we would talk about the five W's and the H, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And it involves active listening. So we want to get our hands on the person's story. We want to literally touch the, the information that they're sharing with us. We want to actively listen and, and give lots of verbal and nonverbal cues that say, yes, I am with you. I have my hands on the story. I'm, I'm grabbing a hold of what you're telling me. And we some, the biggest skill in this point is just asking clarifying questions. So as the person is unfolding a story of joy, a story of sorrow, or reminiscing about days gone by, we want to ask good clarifying questions. And that might be a rephrasing question. So you were 16 when all this happened? Or it might be a clarifying question of, oh, was that, uh, was that when you lived in Seattle? If we knew something about that person's story, we might not know where they were at at the time. We might ask them, so when did this happen? How did this happen? Uh, who, did, who was with you when all this happened? Those are all clarifying questions. The second one, I'm going to go back to this picture of the woman who has her finger up to her, her mouth with that curious look that goes, hmm, tell me more. I want to investigate this further. This is that spirit of curiosity. We want to let our mind and our, our head develop a curiosity for the story. And that's when we're going to tune into the emotions. Uh, we all know that so much of communication is more than just the, the actual words. It's how are the words being expressed. It's the nonverbal cues that are being expressed. I could cross my arms and scrunch up my face, and you could come up to me and say, Nate, what's wrong? And I could say, nothing's wrong. Why are you asking? And you would know from my tone of voice, you would know from my body language, and you'd know from the scrunched up look on my, on my face that, hmm, he says that nothing's wrong, but I don't believe him. Everything else is communicating to me that something's wrong. So many times with those that we love and we know really well, we can just read them like a book. We don't even have to think very hard or be very curious to figure out what uh, they're trying to tell us. But with someone you've just met or with someone who's in deep, deep despair and you're really just trying to get to the bottom of everything, you have to get to the emotions behind what they're telling you. Not just what are they telling you, but how are they telling you this? Are they telling this to you with a smile on their face? Are they telling this with you, to you with their arms crossed? Are they telling you, this to you through tears and sobs? Are they telling this to you with a great big smile? And so sometimes if when all else fails and you're really trying to figure out what's their emotional state, you just have to ask, tell me, what do you mean by this? What's, what's going on for you emotionally? So many times... Maybe asking the question, well, how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? Sometimes that can get tired. Sometimes that can be hard to, to swallow for the person that's on the receiving end of that question. So just by asking them, what do you mean by, and then fill in the blank, or what's it like for you when this is happening? Those are great tools to add to your toolbox to help you listen with your head. Listen to that with that spirit of curiosity. Why are they telling me this? Why are they telling me this now? How are they telling this to me? So as you're actively listening with your hands on the story, asking good questions, listening intently, not overstepping and offering advice or trying to solve the problem immediately, you begin to internally in your mind start to process what's going on and, and figure this all out. 
Then we want to listen with our heart. And the figure of the little uh, little block guy with the broken heart, um, that's that old, old metaphor that's been around forever. You know, someone's really sad or has been disappointed or been let down. Oftentimes we'll say, oh, your, your heart's broken. You must be heartbroken over all that's happened. We just found out literally yesterday that good family friends of ours, um, one of them died. This lady, she has been married for 30 plus years. They're dear, dear souls. They uh, love their family. They love their church friends. They have been together for through thick and thin. And he just suddenly died. We don't know really what the whole story is at this point, but it's, you know, it's maybe even trite to say that she's now heartbroken. As someone begins to, to share their level of, of despair or share even the great joys of their life, again, picture that, that teenage girl that was just asked out to prom by the boy that she's had a crush on all school year. How excited she is when she shares that news. She might say things like, oh, I've got butterflies, or, or I'm through the roof with excitement, or, or whatever teenage phrase she might use. That's oftentimes how we communicate is through metaphors. We don't say something like, well, my endorphin levels of, of serotonin are extremely high right now because of my excitement. No, we say things like, I'm so excited I could just explode, or my excitement levels through the roof, or I'm, I'm so excited I could just smile from ear to ear. And we know literally our smile doesn't go from ear to ear, but we know that that's a metaphor. We know that's a figure of speech. We know that that's just an image that's being used to express the depth of what they're trying to share. So we tune into that. That's that third level of the story is the metaphor. So they start with the content of the story, the who, what, when, where, where, why, and how. They get to the emotional processing. Are they joyful? Are they sorrowful? Are they grieving? Are they angry? Are they just completely apathetic? We're looking at nonverbal cues. We're getting curious, wondering why they're telling us this. Why are they telling this, us this now? And then we get to the last one, which is the metaphor, the images. What are the verbal images that are being put out there? Oftentimes in hospice work, I've heard many a person talk to me about, I just want to go home. And sometimes they literally want to go to their street address, wherever that street address might be. But sometimes that's a, a metaphor that just communicates the deepest desire of just wanting to be free from the pain and the sorrow and the suffering of this life and go to their next life, whatever that might be for them. Hands, head, heart. That's the three parts of a person's story, and we match the three parts of the person's story with the three levels of listening. Here's a great quote by Leo Buscaglia. He wrote a wonderful children's book on grief called The Fall of Freddie the Leaf. And I'm not sure where this quote is taken from, but he is uh, quoted as saying, too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. I am such a big believer in this. I totally want to see an army of hope advancing the cause of faith, hope, and love. And oftentimes that cause is advanced through a smile, a gentle touch on an arm, a handshake, a hug, a kind word. Oh, kindness is so far out of our culture anymore. Just to be kind to one another goes so far. A listening ear, just an honest compliment, the smallest act of caring, buying someone a drink at Starbucks, writing them a handwritten little note, going next door to meet the new neighbors with a, a loaf of fresh bread, shoveling their sidewalk in the, in the wintertime, raking up leaves, uh, going the extra mile, and, and just doing something out of kindness without expecting anything in return. That advances hope. It advances hope that 
wow, someone does really care about me. Someone does really want to advance the good. Um, when it seems like so many people are just out to gain their own um, pats on the back, they'll only do something if they're going to get posted on Facebook about it or make the evening news for being such a kind-hearted person. We want to advance hope. We want to advance hope in the lives of children, of teens, of homeless, of hurting, of suffering, of ill, of whoever it might be, just someone who's having a bad day, who isn't on their deathbed, who's not facing a life-altering crisis, whose family is relatively well uh, of well accord, but we all just have a bad day and we want to advance hope to those people. And I want to see you encouraged to do that through listening, through touch, through a kind word, through a compliment. So I'd really encourage you to, to take a moment and pause. Who is the person that, that comes to mind when I say they're having a bad day or their world seems to just be coming apart? Who is that person that comes to mind? What could be done to listen well to them? What could be done to uh, advance a, an act of kindness for them? Maybe jot that down, make yourself a little mental sticky note, and act upon it. Next, a huge key in our levels of listening is to develop your curiosity. As I mentioned at the intro here, curiosity may have killed the cat, but it sure uh, hasn't killed listening. Curiosity feeds our listening skills. Curiosity advances this cause to bring hope to the hopeless. We have to be curious about what it's like to be in this person's shoes. We have to, to dive into their story, wrap our hands around their story. Sometimes we literally have to wrap our, our arms around the person that's, that's sobbing tears upon tears upon tears upon bucket loads of tears. And then we have to, when the moment is right, we develop a curious spirit just to say, you know, what's it like for you to, to share all these tears in this moment? What's it like for you to be going through this right here, right now in this moment? That's, a, that's an act of curiosity that lets the person know that you're with them, that you're there, that you're literally in their story with them and not going to let go of their story until you can walk with them through the, the valleys. So developing our curiosity, that's that, that healthy suspicion. Why are they telling me this? Boy, what's it like for them to be here right now telling me this? I wonder what's going through their mind. I wonder what's going through their heart. Do they even have words for this? Who's with them? What's their support system like? Those are all curious questions that oftentimes run through my mind as I'm caring for and trying to connect with a person who's sharing their story, oftentimes stories of, of sorrow, but sometimes stories of joy. If you're the first person to hear joyful news, maybe you're curious as, well, why did you choose me? Why are you choosing me for this joyful news? So develop that curiosity. So here's a, here's a case study for you. If you have a pad with you, a paper, or if you just want to think through this, you can even use the chat box to, to share your insights. Martha, a coworker, just came back to work after the death of her mother. She confides to you in tears, this has been the hardest week of my life. So start with, how do you respond empathically? How do you respond with empathy? How do you get your hands on the person's story? Do you paraphrase um, their responses? Do you ask clarifying questions? What's the first thing you would do if you're Martha's coworker and she, you see Martha and you say, oh, Martha, I've been thinking about you all week. What's the next statement? What do you say to her when she says, this has been the hardest week of my life? Jot down a couple of thoughts and then we'll, we'll go to the, the next slide. OK. 
go back. So Martha, your coworker, just came back after a death in her family. She says to you, oh, this has been the hardest time of my life. A clarifying question might be, oh, Martha, tell me more about what it was like for you to be with your family. Or it might be, um, who from your family was able to be there for you when you had the funeral? Or it might be, would you be able to tell me more about your mom? I'd love to hear about her. Those are sometimes just good initial listening questions just to invite the person to share uh, what she means by this has been the hardest week of my life. You may think that you understand that and intuitively you probably do know what she means by that, but it's always so good to ask the questions, you know, what do you mean this has been the hardest week of your life or, or how has it been hard? What part of this has been hard for you? Then we go on to listening with our hands. And this is really getting to the emotions of it. As Martha is sharing this with you, and as you begin to ask her more questions, if she's able to open up to you, you're pondering in your, in your head, what's going on here? What must she be feeling? What must she be thinking? And you try to validate that by saying something like, oh, Martha, it seems like you are feeling so blank. Oftentimes, we get to this point and we just kind of freeze because we just don't know where to begin. There's so much going on in this person's life. They, they may be sharing so much with you and in such rapid fire succession that you may just not even know where to begin. But if you go back to the beginning and think to yourself, how can I let Martha know that I'm here with her? That's where you begin is letting her know that you were there, you were listening, you care, and you do that through validating, oh, Martha, it seems like you are feeling sad. Or, Martha, I see you sharing this with tears in your eyes. Or, Martha, I don't know exactly what this must be like for you, but I can imagine it must be so hard for you to, to go through the hardest week of your life. Those are very simple statements that you can just rephrase what Martha has shared with you. So I'd encourage you to practice a validating response. I'll play the role of Martha and you jot down a note of what's a, a one way that you could validate her feelings. Oh, 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 I'm so glad that you're here. I've been looking forward to just catching a minute with you when I get back from work. You see, oh, last week was the hardest week of my whole life. My mom died suddenly. She was in Kansas City. We had to drive out there through the middle of the night. We got there. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what funeral home to contact. We didn't know um, my sister lives in a whole other state, and she wasn't able to fly in until later on. We were just so lost, so confused. It was the hardest week of our lives. And I just have to tell you, I feel so exhausted. So if that was Martha sharing with you, her coworker, maybe in the break room, maybe at, at a conference room before a meeting, maybe out in the parking lot, how would you respond? How would you validate that with her? Sometimes you only have a minute to literally let her know that you hear her, you are there to connect with her, and you want the best for her in this difficult time. So jot down one or two things that you could validate for Martha based upon what I just shared. And then finally, we want to make sure that we listen with our heart. We want to listen for the images that are being shared. As I just gave the example of Martha, I shared a couple of images. Did you catch them? A couple of metaphor statements, a couple of statements that were like figures of speech that described what my state of being is in that moment. So I'd encourage you to think back to that, or if you're watching the recording, rewind, <laughs> go back, listen to um, Martha's response, and then jot down what one or two of those um, phrases were 
that were the, the emotional phrases, that were the metaphor phrases to, that Martha would be sharing with you? The first one was, oh, this has been the hardest week of my life. Literally, it very well could have been the hardest week of Martha's life. But maybe she's had other really, really, really hard weeks. And this is just one that ranks right up there with the rest of them. So that's one metaphor or phrase to pay attention to, one heart uh, phrase to, to tap into. Another one would be, oh, I felt so confused. And I felt so exhausted. I felt, maybe Martha, Martha would say, I felt so confused like my mind was just on a different planet. Literally, her mind was not on Mars or Venus or Saturn. It was still inside of her skull, but the way she felt was that nothing made sense, that nothing could be uh, upside, everything felt turned upside down. Sometimes that's another common phrase. I listed some phrases here on the slide. I feel like there's a hole in my heart where everywhere I turn, she is there. Those could have been phrases that someone in Martha's shoes could have shared. Or I just can't cry another tear. I feel like I'm on a deserted island. Or maybe the emotion isn't necessarily sadness, as in, as in losing a loved one. Again, maybe the emotion is joy or celebration. I just got promoted. This is the job of my dreams. Or we'll say things like, oh, I'm on cloud nine. Or I just want to shout to the whole world how awesome I feel. Literally, you can't shout so the whole world can hear you. But again, those are just statements that we express without even sometimes realizing it. So listening with our heart means that we're interpreting the image. We're trying to get to the meaning behind the phrase. And we're trying to really unpack that with the person so that they can find meaning in the midst of whatever they're going through. That's what listening does. It allows the person who's having the, who's doing the sharing it allows them to find meaning and find that hope, find that strength to go another step because someone is there with them listening to the story, listening with hands and head and heart. If you're not familiar with Brene Brown, she um, is a very, very wonderful speaker. She's got wonderful resources out there in her books and her TED Talks on empathy and, are, and validation are just amazing. Would highly recommend anything that she does you take a look at. But she says, if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. Think about the people that need a, a trustworthy soul to share their soul with because their story is one of trauma or abuse. And if someone is flippant with their story or someone starts to formulate um, generic responses instead of truly listening with deep intention to that person's so story, there's going to be a sense of shame like, oh, I'm not even worth listening to. I'm never going to share this again with anybody because every time I do share it, someone just like stomps all over my, my heart. So I'm just going to close up and never share my, my story again. So that's why it's so critical, gang, whether the person's 5 or 105, to listen with great empathy, great care, great connection. Unfold the story. Let the story unfold without judgment, without rushing in, without trying to solve all the problems. And to validate, validate, validate that I hear you. I see your emotions as you share this with me. And as I hear you sharing, I'm hearing some words, some phrases, some images that seem to be expressing the deeper, deeper components of the story. That's where shame will not survive. That's where shame is rooted out, booted out, not allowed in the door because you 
are holding that moment with that person. You're listening to their soulful voice. You're listening with the same intention that you would listen to a, a symphony, the same focus that you would listen to your favorite song, the same focus that allows you to then recite every word of your favorite song or every word from every song on the album of your favorite artist. That's the level of listening that we want to bring to people who are in hurt, hurting, distressed, sorrow, whether it's grief, whether it's health care failure, whether it's life transition, getting a new job, losing a job, getting laid off, worries about finances, worries about parenting, fears of failure, fears of, of death, fears of success, whatever is going on, we want to respond as agents of hope with our complete attention on this person to unfold the three parts of their story with the three levels of listening. And we want to be that person who captures the story and holds on to the story with empathy and understanding so that shame will not enter the picture. Soulful voices. That's every person's story is a soulful story. It's a story of meaning. It's a story of stories of joy, stories of sorrow, stories of laughter, stories of tears. And I want to encourage you to listen with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength to this story. Get your hands on the story ask those clarifying questions, develop your curiosity as the person's emotions begin to come to the surface. Don't be afraid of the emotions. Don't run away from the emotions. Don't try to squelch the emotions. Invite the person to dive into those emotional places and share their story more fully with you as a person that can be trusted and accepting it full on. So I hope that you've benefited from this time together today. I'm going to um, take the, the live session off of mute. Um, and if there's any questions or any comments um, and you're hearing this live, I'd love to hear from you. If you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you'll be receiving the replay of this webinar. You'll be uh, continuing to receive the Hope Connection resource that I put out each week. And I have a special for any new person who joins up with the Hope Connection. Every new person until August 1st is going to receive a special recording that will play off of this recording and go into advanced listening skills. It will take this uh, Soulful Voices presentation and really unpack the three levels of listening even further than what I've done today. And so please share this um, information with your colleagues, whether they're teachers, administrators, nurses, doctors, lawyers, social workers, neighbors that volunteer at their church to teach third grade Sunday school, whether they're um, friends in business who are those um, wonderful, compassionate, uh, small business owners who really disciple and mentor uh, youth as they're learning um, on-the-job training. Those people are people who need to listen well. Those people are people out there who are there to advance faith, hope, and love. And so for every new uh, subscriber to the Hope Connection, they're going to get access to this advanced training. And I'll be sending out a link for you all to share. So I'm going to take this off of mute. And if anyone live wants to share, you're welcome. Hi, Nate. Um, hey, this was um, really good for me, having been a teacher and you know, we did lots of paraphrasing when we were coaching each other as teachers. Or, um, But I love the way you kind of tied in the, the three parts of the story with the levels of the listening. You know, hands for content, head for the emotion, and the heart for the metaphor. And um, I forget about the metaphors when I'm listening to somebody, so this is going to be very helpful. Well, and I don't, I don't have a, a, a good example right off the top of my head, but maybe you could think of a time when you've been, you know, in the classroom or on the playground with a, a young child, or they, you know, stopped by with their parent after school and had a concern and and shared something with you. You know, what would be a, what would be one of those kind of metaphor phrases, or what would be one of those um, encounters that come to your mind? 
when someone was really sharing, you know, kind of the depths of their their struggles with you? Well, um, you know, teaching fifth and sixth grade girls, there's lots of drama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they're truly feeling that with their friends and having trouble getting along maybe in a, a group of three. And they need somebody to hear them and listen and validate those emotions because they can't get past that to go on to their learning. Right. So as a teacher, you you know, you're dealing more with just the teaching of the content areas, but their emotions at that age really really are a big factor. So you really have to um, listen with all three areas. Right, or or even sometimes it might not necessarily be an image, but it might be just a, a hyperbole or an over exaggeration. You know, yeah. oh, no one likes me, or I am just the worst kid ever, or um, all my friends are are against me. Everyone's turned their back on me. You know, that's a a common phrase you might. Uh, you might yeah. hear we have a daughter heading into fifth grade, and that's been um, that's been our summer of, <laughs> of communication. <laughs> yeah, you know, at that age, they feel you know like no one wants to be their friend, or right. uh, yeah. So it's it's very important. Well, and then you get to the kids, the primary grades, and you know it's it's a little bit different because they they seem to be more more loving, more accepting, um, but yet, you know, they have feelings too, so you really do have to listen to them, but it's a, li- a little easier with the younger ones to kind of talk to them and validate and kind of convince them, yeah. you know, everything's going to be okay. So. Yeah, and sometimes with the younger kids, they're, they're so emotionally tied up into whatever's going on that, that like you said, they, they just need that outlet. You know, and if they're not able to verbally um, outlet it, you know, giving them, um, you know, a, a coloring sheet, you know, giving them something physical to, to squeeze and hold on to, um, you know, giving them an opportunity to um, to do something physical, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, cleaning a table or, or arranging some books. I know, you know, for me sometimes when I'm just, kind of in my head and I don't really have words for whatever is troubling me. I just need to get my hands on something um, before I can start sharing what's on my mind. <laughs> and it goes hand in hand with that. But uh, um, it, it is. I think that, that this is a- applicable to all ages and stages of life. And in the hospice world, I've, you know, tried to help validate, you know, our, our folks that are, 80, 90, 100 years old, uh, let them know that, you know, we're here for you, we hear you. Some of their metaphors, some of their images that they're sharing are different than that of the younger um, generations, but some of the feelings are the same, feelings that no one's there for me. I feel all alone. I feel isolated. I feel hurt. I feel betrayed. I feel mad, sad, glad, um, you know, you name it, so... Yeah, well, like with um, one of my residents, she'll talk, you know, I'll kind of ask her about her children, and she, you know, says the same things over and over, but you have to validate, you know, they don't come by all the time to visit. Oh, they're busy with work. So you try to, you know, paraphrase that or validate that, like, oh, I, I, you know, understand how you feel when they don't come around as often as you would like them to. But, you know, that kind of stuff. So it is a little different with the older ones. Yeah. Yeah. There's that desire for the connection, that desire to be with the people that you love and have that yes. meaningful interaction. And when it's not yeah. there, it's distressful and it's it's hurting, you know. Cause right. Some folks may not, you know, a, a seven-year-old may not understand it at their level, an 87-year-old may not understand it at their level. A 27-year-old uh, may not understand it at their level, but it still hurts. It's still a pain that um, is a very common pain, a very common source of of disruption. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Well, anything, right, well, Joni, from your perspective that you think would be helpful to share for, for folks out there? 
something else I could share? Anything. If there's anything else that stood out to you or or this reminded you of a of a case, you know, from your experience. Like I said, I've not taught in a classroom like that, but I, I can from the teachers I know and my wife working at a school, those uh, seems like there could be a lot that uh, goes on there that uh, relates to listening. Oh, it's it, it, exactly. When you were talking about the five W's and the H, that's just, you know, that content and getting to those clarifying questions is so important, no matter, you know, if you're a nurse, like you said, or a teacher or, you know, hospice caregiver. And um, I think... The hardest thing is being able to figure out those nonverbal cues. Yeah. But then that's, like you said, where that curiosity comes into, and then you start coming up with those questions. Because um, sometimes it's hard. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Well, you do an amazing job out there, Joni. I can see how uh, um, just, you know, you've got a, a knack for for getting into these stories and listening to these soulful voices, and you you really do care for your folks, and I could see how you care for those students in your classroom. And, and thank you as well to those folks, again, because we're recording this and we know and, and trust that this is going to be helpful to those folks working in, uh, in health care, those folks serving in the business community, those folks that volunteer their time in their faith communities, uh, wherever you are at, whatever you do to advance hope. For the folks who feel like everything is hopeless, feel like everything is lost, feel like everything has turned against them, you are an agent of hope. You are the light in this dark world that this person feels has enveloped them. And by listening well, by hearing them out, by providing that compassionate presence in the moment, you are advancing hope. And so you have my deepest, deepest gratitude for that. Again, please share this recording. Please share the Hope Connection with everyone you know um, because in the next week, anyone who signs up for the Hope Connection is going to get special access to a training that's only available to new subscribers to the Hope Connection. So thanks, Joni, for joining me live. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everybody, for who will watch this uh, down the road. And I look forward to joining you again uh, next month. Next month, I'm going to switch it up. I, I thought I might do a presentation on boundaries, but I think I'm going to do a presentation on uh, on uh, on fear. Um, that seems to be a, a big struggle that goes on in a lot of a lot of places. So join us uh, next month and I'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Bye. Have a great day. You too.